very much um, for um, giving me the opportunity to give this presentation to you today. Um, uh, I was a bit nervous about giving this presentation, to be honest, because I'm not an expert in public and pa uh, patient and public involvement, but I'm just a researcher struggling with a topic. And because I'm struggling with the topic, I'm writing a bit about it and I'm trying to understand what's happening and what's going on and how I can actually involve my patients in the field I'm working in. I'm an epidemiologist working at a clinical department. So um, a lot of patients are involved and there is a lot of um, um, mixing uh, between um, clinical care and between uh, research. So I think that that's that's a good thing, and that would increase the possibilities of patient and public involvement. Sander, could you move to the next slide? So that's me struggling with the patient and public involvement. Um, yeah. So this is me now at the moment, or this was actually me a couple of years ago. At the moment, um, um, this I've, I've could have said this. This was cited from a uh, paper from Froland. Um, who tried to uh, qualitatively assess how um, 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 researchers think about um, um, involving patients and the public into um, um, into clinical into research practices. So one of the reasons said that our proposal was rejected by a patient decision, and and the and the therefore the the patient was basically wrong, and the scientist was right. Uh, Sander, could you move on to the next slide? And um, this was also me a couple of years ago. If a funding body would ask me, like, uh, you should write something about patient and public involvement in your proposal, then I would definitely do that. But I would sort of write a standard text, which we probably all have, about how I was going to implement the data and how I was going to work uh, with patients in disseminating the data. But real patient and public involvement, that was not for me. Until now, until a couple of um, a months, a couple of years ago, I read more about patient and public involvement and why we should actually do that. Sander, can you move to the next slide? So researchers learn from uh, exchange of knowledge with patients and caregivers, and that influences their plans and actions. And it actually makes research more reliable and more applicable to clinical practice and more applicable to the situations of patients. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. So the future me would be the one who is totally um, involved in patient and public involvement and who is enthusiastic about it and who wants to pitch and want to learn from patients. So how did I try to become that enthusiastic how did i get that enthusiastic about patient involvement yeah yeah you can move to the next slide so patient involvement actually has a lot of different aspects this goes from peer review to writing patients um, friendly summaries to citizen science to funding agency to consumer peer review but that's not that's too much for a 15 minute talk. So the only thing I'm going to speak about today is how to involve your patients in your clinical studies. Yeah. So what I want to discuss is the why, the when and the how of uh, patient and public involvement in your studies. So why would we want to do that? Patients can obviously have a different perspective from the rest of your research team, which is all involved of um, uh, researchers. But as Sander just correctly said, we are basically all patients. I mean, I go to the dentist. I sometimes go to the general practitioner. And probably all of you also sometimes visit some kind of a health professional. So we're not that far away from knowing how it is to be dependent on someone or to to um, rely on research or on other different things. And I think we should keep that in mind when speaking about this. It has the potential to improve the research quality and the relevance. And obviously there is a moral imperative for involving patients in our clinical studies. Yeah. So the other why is actually more is actually very important as well. We should involve patients and the public in our studies because we have a very serious problem here. Yeah, thanks. Because 80% of the research is wasted. 
Um, in a study in 2019, Kelmers and Klesio and lots of others wrote a very nice series of papers in The Lancet about avoidable ways in the production of and reporting of research. And one of the main problems in this avoidable way, way, uh, waste was, can you move on to the next slide? Uh, that, uh, that clinicians and researchers don't ask the relevant questions and don't lose, use the appropriate outcomes. So not the important for patient important, important outcomes are assessed. And the, basically there's basically low priority questions being assessed in clinical research. The only way to change this is to involve the ones who are really beneficiaries of our research, the patients, because those are the only ones who can tell us what are what the important outcomes for them are or what the relevant questions are. So we need to collaborate. Yes. Thank you. So that's basically also why uh, many funders are now prepared to use uh, to to um, um, make patient or public involvement obligatory in their funding schemes. So you have to have some form of patient and public involvement in your funding. Yeah. And this pays off because, for example, but this is just one example, there is a higher participation rate in studies in which uh, patients were involved in the uh, setup of the study. But we also got to be honest. Um, yeah, can you go on to the next slide? The real impact of patient involvement might not only be in the quality of the studies. It's also into um, increasing um, 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 inf information. It might not always increase the quality of the studies in the uh, uh, because there's more needed for that. We need to do less research, do better research, and do more research with better methods. But it does give an um, um, improvement in the evaluation of the uh, outcomes of studies, and it increases diversity. It um, makes it more implementable. Yeah, Sander, thanks. So then we come to the when. When should we... In, in, when should we involve patients into our research? And that's something I'm struggling with. I don't know about you, but when I am writing a proposal, I usually find the um, uh, funding um, call just a little bit too late. Then I wait with starting to write for about two weeks. Then there's usually about three or two weeks left before the deadline. And then I start writing and I start brainstorming with my colleagues and then I work for nights and then I submit the... Um, um, the grant proposal. And if, if there's one of one, one person in this room who does it differently, then I would really like to learn from that person who really starts in time with everything uh, working for him. I would really like to learn that. But I'm, I'm a bit afraid that most more people um, recognize this, uh, this problem. So then I also always have the problem of then when should I, should I uh, meet these patients in these two weeks time I have before the call? Well, and then I ended up not doing it because I thought if I'm not in time, then why should I actually bother of even um, involving them? But I was very wrong. And since I'm doing it differently, um, my studies improved. So when should you um, um, uh, involve your patients or public or whoever into your studies? You can basically do that all the time. It's never too late. So in the first step, identifying and prioritizing. Yes, Senna, can you go to the next slide? Uh, oh yeah, so this is how I did it first years ago. That's basically probably what people recognize. Then I wrote this piece about how I involve patients and then I said, okay, that's very good. But now really involving patients really helps for the quality of your study. So in identifying and prioritizing, you should have discussions about uh, your um, um, aims for your studies. And you shouldn't just do that when you were starting to write this call, because this is something you can basically do all the time. So that's not dependent on a fund or grant call or in on the idea of a new studies. study. You, every one of us can discuss our ideas with whoever we want, also patients or the public at any point in time. And it's even becoming more easy to do that thanks to the COVID pandemic where you can easily, easily 
um, um, invite patients for, for example, an online focus group for a discussion or just asking them what they think about your ideas or what their ideas are. In um, commissioning, yeah, some, yeah, thanks. Um, patients can be involved in reviewing research proposals. And then that is a bit of a problem. Then indeed you should be on time. Um, but otherwise, usually the fundraiser will uh, let your um, um, idea be reviewed by a, a patient or by someone from the public. So you better do that yourself. In designing and managing the study, um, um, patients can identify the right way to communicate with patients. And for example, that will increase the, um, the, the, the number of patients who actually want to be um, involved in your study. They can suggest ways to ensure diversity. They can help you with written information and user-friendly information and plain language. In undertaking the studies, they can um, um, help you with carrying out the interview or running focus groups. Um, I've actually done this a couple of, two, I think about two years ago, running focus group with patients involved. And that really helps because patients usually have different questions than we do. So that, that really helps in getting more information and that increases the reliability of your study. Patients can help in disseminating and implementing the research because they are the only one who have real access to the patient group. Because we will also be always, Sandra, can you go on to the next slide? We will also always, we as researchers will always be a bit um, a people who are on the sideline, even doctors are. So the only ones who have are real members of the community of patients you um, um, are studying are um, the ones uh, are, are the ones who have access to implementing and disseminating your results. Yeah. So in evaluating the impact, um, patients can help with not only having impact in um, in journals and medical journals, in biomedical journals, in preprints, in whatever, but also in writing uh, your papers for the ones who really need it and those are the patients and it would be helpful some patients are interested in that in that and it would be helpful if we make our pa papers or at least a summary of our pa papers a bit more um, useful for patients also in the language we use yeah okay so now we know that that's a, that's the thing we know and this is probably the thing we already know everybody of us knows that we can do it on every moment and we should do it but then we come to the question, am I too late? Because that's what I always thought. I'm too late if I didn't start on time. So Sander asked me to actually have some, I've heard that, that, that before, Sander asks us to have some really practical um, advice about patient participation and how to do it. So this is where that part of the talk begins. How should you do it? First, you need to be aware of the um, letter of involvement in patient participation. Yes, Sander, can you go on to the next slide? Because it's really not that difficult. Yeah. There are different levels of control a patient or patient organization of the public can have. You can inform patients, you can consult them, you can ask them for advice, you can really collaborate, or they can have the control about um, the thing you want to do. Yeah. Controlling is the highest step in um, public participation, and that's placing the decisions in the hands of the community and the individuals. If we are collaborating, we are working in a partnership with communities and patients in each aspect of the decision. So patients are real part of the uh, study team and the, they, they have an um, um, equal saying in whatever we are going to decide. You can also ask patients for advice. That's, for example, in partnership boards, in reference groups, or in service users, or you can consult patients. That's in obtaining community and individual feedback on analyzers or alternatives or on decisions. And the so to say lowest, but lowest might be not the best word for that, 
um, uh, step in the ladder is providing communities and individuals with balanced objectives and information to assist um, the understanding of problems and also to find different solutions. But that to do that in uh, newsletters or press releases or on your own website in blogs. Um, so that's basically something we can all always do. However, for real patient involvement, so not only for information or consultation, but if patients are really involved in your study, there need to be some level of expertise from your side. So get yourself trained in patient participation. I will tell you more about that later, or at least show you where you can get those resources. You can get trained in part patient participation, but also patients who want to be involved in steps higher than information and consultations um, and need to be trained in what research is, how, what, what we're actually trying to do. And dependent on, on in what step and what step in the ladder you want to involve patients, um, there need to be more or less training. And then it would be honest of us to also provide this training if we write um, fund um, uh, grants and also to uh, budget this training. So not only to ask patients, uh, but also to um, um, give them a bit of background and to um, actually pay for giving them this big bit of background. Yeah. So there comes the question, who? M me as an epidemiologist working on a clinical department, sometimes it's very easy to know the who, because I'm studying tinnitus, for example, and uh, then I know that the ones who have to be involved in my studies are tinnitus patients. The other thing is that sometimes I don't know who has to be involved in my studies, because sometimes as an epidemiologist, I'm doing more methodological research on improving outcomes or improving the quality of writing of papers. And even then, uh, fundraisers um, ask for patient participation. So how can you do that? Here are the practical tips. The Patient Federation in the Netherlands has a, a platform for um, finding your um, uh, patients, uh, patient groups, and they are very willing to help you with finding the right people for your um, uh, research. In England, the people in research.org, and I hope that we get a website like that as well, um, have made it very easy for um, researchers and um, the public to connect because this is not only about patients but also about public involvement, which is then again ideal for my studies about the quality of research, about communication in research. In the Netherlands, we have the participatie compass, which I had never had a look at, but uh, I will use it now, from now on each and every day I work with, um, I've, I have a new idea for research because this can actually, the participatie compass can actually show you, um, um, do, does actually do the same thing as the people in research. It gives you connections between patient organizations and researchers, and it helps you with finding the right groups of patients. Yeah. So involve patients in the implementation of your study. So, for, so contact patients association, discuss and really listen to them. The Cochrane is another very good example. They have the Cochrane Con Consumer Network, which is a network of patients who can, who are very willing to be involved in your studies, who actually peer review uh, the um, um, systematic reviews and who also who are also involved in writing the um, uh, public um, summaries. In the UMC Utrecht, we have the participatie house, um, which shows you all the possibilities we have within and outside the UMC Utrecht. And there is actually a very nice um, um, thing that came out of the participatie house, which is the, yeah. But thank you. Participation matrix, involvement matrix, participation matrix or involvement matrix. And the involvement matrix gives you the opportunity to um, um, actually formalize your um, um, discussions you have with patients. So that it is clear for everybody in which step of the ladder you, you both of you are involved 
and what you expect of patients and what the patients can expect of you when they are involved in your studies. It's a very easy tool and I would really um, encourage you to have a look at the website because they have a very nice um, movie about that, very nice clip about how it actually works. And um, 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 it really gives insights in, in for you and the patients who is connected to your research uh, on what, what you want to do and what you want to ask them and what they can ask uh, from you. Um, so, and then again, I'm sometimes a bit late with trying to use this kind of tools, but then again, it's never too late. You can always, you can go to the next slide, start um, uh, your patient participation. So even if you're already in the, um, in the phase of analyzing your results, you can still ask patients to participate. Yes, you're late. Yes, you should explain that. But it's never too late and you should still do that. Thank you. Uh, Sander? Yeah. So also, if you have, if you're organizing a symposium or a conference or a talk, try to include patients in your conference or symposium or talk. And you shouldn't think that they just come and run to your symposium. You should actually invite them. So invite patient organizations and invite people to really participate and also ask them what they would like to uh, learn or hear um, in, your, um, uh, in, your, in your symposium. We, I've actually very good um, um, experiences with that in, for example, the Cochrane uh, Colloquia. So the, 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 the conferences from the Cochrane organization, they have included patients in their um, 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 conferences. And um, uh, that really helps in discussions about, for example, outcome measures. And I also know some researchers who are not going to conferences anymore if patients are not included. I think that goes a bit far, but I think you should keep it in mind. Another thing which I found strange is not happening is plain language summaries. Plain language summaries are exactly what they um, seem to be. It's a summary of your research in plain language. Yes, you can continue to the next slide. And um, as was studied in 2020, is that despite the progressive movement towards clinical trial transparency, easy accessible plain language summaries on clinical trials are currently scarce. That's I thought that's very interesting because in clinical research, there is doctors working, epidemiologists working, statisticians working, a lot of people are actually working with patients, but it doesn't come to mind to make a plain language summary. Um, I haven't done it yet, to be honest. Yeah, I've done it for Cochrane Review, but not for my other research, but I, um, um, uh, I am going to do that from now on uh, because it's easy. There's one problem. Cochrane has actually a method for that, for writing plain language uh, summaries. I think the disadvantage of this methodological paper of Cochrane is that it's a bit long. So uh, it makes it look more difficult than it is, I think, but it is good to have a look at this um, uh, guideline. Um, and then there's another problem, and that's that most journals don't um, uh, facilitate plain language summaries, but then you could easily do it yourself. Many of us nowadays have a website or Twitter or um, um, uh, a blog or whatever. It shouldn't be too difficult to write these plain language summaries yourself. Yeah. So what I hope this talk did is gave you a bit of more insight how patient part and public participation is for clinical researchers. I hope you recognize some of it. I actually also hope there's someone around here who um, um, is um, um, having more uh, practices and more best practices about this and is, 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 is very good in, 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 in making particip patients participate on time um, and maybe have some more advice on how to do that. But I think that this is the way to go, to improve research and also, to be honest, to make research um, uh, to, to really see the effect of your research, because that's also what it does. It really, if you're collaborating with patients, it also shows you the direct and immediate effect of what you're actually doing. And I think that's good for 
um, the researchers, the patients, and for research. 